long and fascinating week, and uh, I'm the guy who's standing between you and your taxis. Um, uh, first of all, even though I'm the very last person here, I want to I want to thank Jim and Kai and Ligian for organising this marvellous week. I've come away with lots of ideas, and I'm very excited having come here. So thank you for inviting me to the Huron Valley and Ann Arthur, and I hope we have many, many more meetings like this here. So let's thank Jim just to... Uh, and the second thing is I have to apologize because I was going to, uh, like Colin, I was going to prepare my talk last night, but we went out drinking. <laughs> and as a result, I've been doing it in the last few minutes. And uh, if it looks a bit badly organized, then that's because I've been scrambling to put it all together. But I try to give you a perspective. Uh, what's important? What are the questions? What's next? And this will merge adiabatically into our discussion. Okay, uh, where Jim and I are going to try and lead with all of you. So. Um, so, okay, so before I begin, let me just mention that my involvement in, in Sumerian Hexaborite really uh, has uh, involved this cast of characters, particularly Maxim de Zero, Kai Sun, Victor Galitsky, more recently, Vic Alexandrov, Paula Gerton, who told you about his work yesterday, and Brian <coughs> Kaimi, who's at uh, CUNY. Um, and uh, so I wanted to try and step back for a moment. <coughs> give it a little bit of a historical perspective, in part because maybe that gives us a way of thinking about the future. Okay. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, as physicists, particularly if you're a young phys physicist, um, um, you think that all the good stuff may have gone by, and it's all just a question of fine-tuning your experiment or making your DMFT code work a bit faster. But it's much, much more than that. And what I really want to stress is that we are right in the middle of a revolution, right now, here, okay? And I'm gonna try and persuade you of that, okay? Mainly by asking questions, okay? So, um, <clears throat> if you want to describe our field stretching back over a century, it's that we're interested in Humpty Dumpty. We're interested in how you put it all back together again. Okay? We acknowledge that we understand the physics down on the sub-angstrom scale. But we acknowledge also, we don't understand what happens when you put it together. You get snowflakes, you get magnets, you get light, all emerging on the scale of a micron. Okay, so what happens between the micron and the angstrom? That's emergence, okay? And Landau understood this very, very well when he abstracted this in his notion of psi, the Landau or the parameter, okay? And, uh, <clears throat> but as time has gone on, we realize there are a lot more variables in the equation. One of which, very well known to this community, is the physics of strong correlation, how you mix the Coulomb interaction and how that drives, combined with quantum mechanics, new emerging phenomena, which uh, the earliest examples were the Vigna crystal and ferromagnetism. These were some of the early triumphs of quantum theory. Um, on the other hand, uh, uh, we've heard a lot about topology at this meeting, and topology has also had a lot of triumphs. In the early days, these were in real space. This was in understanding things like vortex lattices, liquid crystals, and perhaps the great triumph of this early period, the costalis Thaulus phase transition. And if you ever read that marvelous paper, you will see that Thaulus was already thinking about churn numbers in that paper. He actually writes down these kind of topological objects. Okay. And of course, <clears throat> if we go on a bit further in time from Victor Crystals, we encounter BCS theory. This was a perfect storm of discovery. Okay. It combined everything. Phenomenology, emergence, even topology came out of it with the vortex lattice. Okay. Uh, and this was really the convergence of everything. And since that time, well, we've had new things. Out of BCS theory came emergence and the Anderson-Higgs mechanism, and we've all heard about the discovery of WZ bosons and the Higgs boson. All of that came out of our field, because physics in the lab is connected to physics in the cosmos. Okay. Uh, and many of us here have been involved in the tremendous developments with strongly correlated materials. In, in the early 80s and the late 70s, the discovery that local moments 
aren't just magnetic, but they involve themselves with the electronic bedding. Heavy fermion, condo insulators, metal, superconductivity, quantum criticality, cuprate, and iron high temperature superconductors. These are all part of that area. But in parallel with that, there's been a complete revolution on the topological side. And uh, <coughs> the integer quantum Hall effect in the early 80s, the discovery of the fractional quantum Hall effect, uh, which involved strong correlation, hence the intersection with strong correlation there. Okay. And then discovery that even in band insulators, you have fascinating consequences of topology. And that this then inspired the whole idea of maybe we could connect this up with a new generation of electronics, a new generation, protected qubits, Majorana fermions. All of this, however, has been really connected with topology and weak interactions. Okay? And here's where Samarium hexaboride comes in. Could it be the beginning of a new storm of discovery, just like the era of BCS? Okay? Um, and uh, I learned a new uh, phrase here uh, from the Würzburg group, topotronics. Okay? I think it's, great. it's a great word. Apparently, that's the name, if I'm, I'm not mistaken, of their new grant. And it's also the name of a German rock band. Uh, and they had to get permission to use this term. Okay, interesting enough. And, and what does that mean? That means whatever you want it to mean. But it could mean what uh, Shankar Sama suggested. Why not try? and uh, induce proximity effect superconductivity on the surface of Samarium hexaboride and see if you can see a vortex lattice with tiny little Majorana fermions sitting in the middle. That would be wonderful. Okay. So actually, this is my main message, and I just want to get discussion going. However, I thought I would go on and say a few more words uh, about the things that really puzzle me and some of the particular questions about Samarium hexaboride and where we're going on next. And this will fold into our discussion. Okay. Um, so, questions to understand. And you can add your questions to this list. This is really a theorist's eye view of this. And uh, so I won't talk about how can we, how can we cleave Samarium hexaboride any better? How can we pair the surface better? How can we do higher resolution spectroscopies? I, that's above my pay grade. I, I won't talk about those things, but I will talk about a few things. I'm particularly interested in the relationship of Samarium hexaboride to magnetism. Okay. <clears throat> if Samarium hexaboride is topological, what are the effects of correlation on the topological Fermi surface? Um, uh, we have a bet going this week, uh, Oliver and I, um, uh, and he's going to give me a donut uh, uh, if uh, these systems are topological. But I already sense uh, uh, that he'd given up a little bit because by using the example of a donut, he's already <laughs> a topologically non trivial object okay, connected with the, with the Gauss Bonnet theorem. So, so I, 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 think, I think I'm already on a roll there. But then, all sorts of issues here. <laughs> yes? Okay, anyway. Um, uh, so what, uh, so be, beyond this, you know, if there are these conducting surface states, they're going to be very close to instability. They could be close to magnetism, and condo breakdown. Bono mentioned this yesterday. Various kinds of magnetism, not just ferromagnetism. There could be density waves. There might even be superconductivity at the border of magnetism if we could only get the surfaces perfect enough. Okay. Um, we heard from George earlier this afternoon about microscopics. Uh, um, we want to know all the energy scales. But one of the things that interests me, what are the atomic states engaged in Samarium hexaboride mixed valence? What are the crystal field states? Um, uh, one of the things that occurred time and time together this week, very interesting to study, and we don't understand it, how to understand the transport. Lots and lots of things. What about the plateau, its sensitivity? If you add, if you add, um, if you kneel the system, the plateau goes up. If you if you mess with the system, the plateau goes down. What's going on here? And we heard very early on in the week that cracks are conducting. Okay, and uh, uh, that is an interesting challenge for anyone who thinks these system is not topological. How do you get conducting cracks? Cracks are normally insulating. Okay, in this system, cracks are conducting. 
That's really fascinating. Although he didn't actually show them conducting, he just showed pictures of them. In fact, the so, resistance changed. No, he did. He didn't prove that that was the cracks causing the change, but it was the hypothesis. Resistance changed after we cracked. I know, but <laughs> nevertheless, is it the cause or effect? You don't know. Uh, but I think, indeed, it, it, it's probably likely. Okay. Um, how to understand the spectroscopies? ARPAs, DHBA, optical, neutron, we heard this morning. This is a tremendous challenge for the field. Uh, uh, the, uh, we heard uh, uh, from Peter Armitage that the optical spectroscopies are not looking, picking up surface states. Uh, what's that due to? Is it because the um, surface states have such a tiny Bruder weight that you just can't see them with the current resolution? <coughs> One thing that fascinates me, Samaria hexaboid is clearly not a regular insulator. It's an adaptive insulator. Its gap appears almost like a BCS theory in low temperatures. Why is that? The theorists say it's a crossover, but it looks like a phase transition. Why does it look like a phase transition? And is there something about its insulating bulk? And what is the pressure field <coughs> phase diagram of Samaria hexaboroid? We don't really know that. We know it's an insulator, but what happens? What field does it quit? Okay, uh, and at what pressure does it quit? We do know the answer to that question. Okay, and what about new TKIs with larger gaps? Uh, uh, we heard about that um, uh, uh, the other morning. Uh, uh, in particular, how and Kassanath's interest, uh, Eva Kassanath's interest in smearing oxide and this serial reunion four tin six system. Neither of these seem to be uh, perfectly gapped uh, insulators, but maybe with the work, maybe with the right substrate, you can drive them in that direction. And this is a very interesting new development. And then beyond TK TKIs, uh, new topologies. We heard about the possibility that uh, Y-bore is a nodal metal. Um, Serum nickel tin is probably also a nodal metal. We just don't understand this phenomenon here. And I'll mention, if I have time, a little bit about condo quasar crystals. There's now a, con a condo quasar crystal that I'll tell you about. Okay? And I'm not going to do all these. These are the things I'm going to just quickly talk about. What is the relationship of Samarium exploit to magnetism? Uh, is there something special about its insulating bulk and beyond TKIs? Okay. Um, I wanted to give a little bit of a historical perspective. And I unfortunately just didn't have time to put everything down here. Uh, but um, in fact, uh, here is a quote from Anderson. I think it's 1978. It's the Rochester Conference. It might have been 96, and I was just writing it. He summarized the meeting, uh, and, he, and I, I don't have the picture of the elephant, but he drew an elephant, OK? And uh, Condo was sliding down its trunk in this picture, uh, and it had a tail. And uh, out of its backside was coming Fermi liquid. Okay? And, and, and so this was Anderson's mixed relationship with Fermi liquids coming out in an early stage. Okay? Um, uh, but anyway, uh, in fact, he talked about the condo lattice. And he talked about said Doniac star on it here. Um, and he talked about it being an extremely hard problem. It's a problem in the same category of problems which are failing to be done in field theory these days. And this is the era of quark confinement. Okay, so he was making a push to use more advanced techniques and new concepts. He also, and I didn't have a chance to get this bit, talked a lot about the conductivity of Samarium hexaboride in this review he gave, and how mysterious it was and how it didn't make sense. Okay? So I think it's very interesting. Um, uh, here's uh, uh, a connection with some of the early ideas of, uh, of Neville Mott. Neville Mott sat on a plane with Brian uh, Maple, and Brian told him about his ideas with Dieter Volev, and, and, uh, and uh, Neville Mott then wrote a, a paper in, uh, in Philosophical Magazine in 1974. And uh, he said a few interesting things. He talked about Sumerian sulfide, which had been the interest of Neighbor and Bolev. And, and, he, and, he, and he thought that something here is excitonic. And we've heard the word excitonic here. Well, that was in his initial speculations about this material. Uh, and he also uh, meant, introduced the idea that the hybridization gap would be important. And, uh, but he also introduced the idea of the condo effect into interacting and competing with the RKKY interaction. So all these things you can find in the abstract of this almost unknown paper from 1974, which got lost for many, many years, and we've really rediscovered it recently, actually. Okay. 
And so, that, so, so these are two great men of science, and of course this stimulated Doniak's work later. Okay. So let me talk a bit about the link with topology. I'm not going to say very much here. Um, but in fact, our field has already had its impact on the topologists. Um, because the way we write the, the Hamiltonian for conduit insulators, all the spin orbit coupling is in the hybridization. And they hadn't really appreciated that. They were really using models in which the hopping involved the spin orbit coupling, the rush bar terms. And uh, it's only recently become clear that, in fact, the Hamiltonian for helium 3b superfluid is basically the same Hamiltonian as the minimal model for a topological conduit insulator. Okay. Here is helium 3b, um, uh, and uh, all you need to know is it has a particle and a whole band, uh, and they uh, cross at the Fermi surface, and there is a topological uh, pairing term here, which on a lattice would look exactly like this in, in the continuum, which is proportional to k. And so what this does is, uh, is to fully gap the Fermi surface, but the direction of the pairing, the, the axis, the d-vector, is actually topological and forms a hedgehog structure around the Fermi surface. This was proposed by the theorists in the 60s, discovered to be relevant for helium-3 in the early 70s, put through, partly through the work of Tommy Leggett. And then only in the late part of the 20th century was it realized it was actually topological. And this is the work of Volovic who deduced that there would be edge states if you take this model for topological conduit insulators and you make the F band exactly equal to the conduction band and you do an edge state calculation, you get exactly Volovic's calculation, except the interpretation of the edge states is different in the context of this particle hole symmetric system. These are the, the uh, long sought after mystical Majoranas, okay? For us, they're the topological edge states, okay? And that's because that's our model for, minimum model for a topological uh, conduit insulator. It's basically a topology version of Neville Mott's hybridization model. That's all it is. This thing has a topology in it, and when you uh, create a hybridization gap, you once again get edge states. These are the edge states of Kane and Mele. And so, can we make anything of this analogy? Okay. Um, there's a remarkable similarity between the hybridization picture of the TKIs and helium 3B. Um, like the superfluid or a superconductor, experimentally, the hybridization gap for condensate is temperature is, is, is a temperature dependent, and it has a VCS-like dependence. It's probably a crossover, but it really grows very rapidly at 50 Kelvin. We don't actually know crossover. We presume it is. Okay. Um, it's an adaptive insulator, closer in spirit to a phase of matter than an inert band insulator, I think. Okay. And what does that mean about it when we start probing it? What are the properties and what new things can it do? We simply don't know at the moment. Okay. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the phase diagram of this system. Okay. As we cool it down, it starts to develop coherence, and somewhere around 50 Kelvin, a gap opens. And at much lower temperatures, we get the plateau conductivity, which is the surface conductivity, okay, which Cooley et al. discovered. And we've seen in this, con this meeting that if you have purer samples with a much higher uh, bulk resistance and probably less cracks on the surface, this crossover occurs at much lower temperatures, as it probably should do if you've only got one conducting surface there. But what about the other directions in the phase diagram? First of all, the pressure axis. We haven't talked much about that. There's not been any new work in that direction. There needs to be, but there, are, there is old data. Um, and before I talk about that, let me remind you of how much pressure has taught us about other heavy fermion systems of which the king of the pack is cerium rhodium indium 5 This is an amazing system known to be an antiferromagnet, but when they put pressure on it, the antiferromagnetism died and it became a superconductor, a D-wave superconductor, with quantum critical behavior. And a lot has been learned about the system by applying a magnetic field as well. Okay. Well, now we come to samarium hexafluoride. There's this one piece of work by the Grenoble group, Barla et al., and they did some beautiful uh, um, NMR work in which they were able to show that a hyperfine uh, shift developed at uh, of six uh, uh, gigapascals. Okay. I haven't had a chance 
to convert 4% volume change times the pressure to milli electron volts per unit cell. I don't know how big that number is, but I bet you it's really small. Okay? It's probably not a great deal. It's probably less than 100 Kelvin, okay? I think. And so I think the magnetism is very, very close to the, super, to the, to the conduit insulating state. Uh, and so, um, uh, by the way, I, I searched for it, and I'm told by my friend Chimia C that the resistivity at this point here is linear. I, I couldn't find the data for it. But if it is, then there's a quantum critical point there, which adds another mystery. Why would this be second order? There's no, no there's any good reason to suppose that, but maybe it is. Okay. And now let's talk about the, the field axis. Um, uh, we know even less about this. <coughs> there is this uh, classic work again by Cooley in 1999, where they blew up their sample. Um, and uh, <coughs> actually, I guess now Cooley's is this curve here, probably. And it's only at 4 Kelvin. I've seen more recent data which suggests that the collapse is not as rapid as this, um, uh, as a function of field. And it, I don't think it's forming a metal at 90 tesla. It's still insulating beyond that point. We don't know where it stops. Okay, that's amazing. And so unlike uh, cerium-343, which collapses its gap at around 60 tesla, this, this system does, doesn't. Moreover, the collapse of the gap is not linear in the field, apparently, which is also very mysterious. Should be Zeeman splitting. And perhaps the reason for this um, is, oops, so, so this critical field is certainly more than 140, I've heard more than 160 tesla. And one of the things that George Zawatsky stressed is that this is an L equals 5 spin equals 5 halves, J equals 5 halves system, which G is actually 2 sevenths rather than 2. So it's a very small G factor. And so that's the reason probably why the field doesn't have a big effect. What the field is doing in this system is orbital, I think. Okay. And so uh, bearing that in mind, and thinking a bit about the superfluids, we are, uh, and when I say we here now, I'm referring to uh, work I've been doing with Ona Gerchen and uh, Oyan Gayemi, have been exploring the possibility that we can take the analogy with the superfluid one step further. Okay? If indeed the system is very close to ferromagnetism or antiferromagnetism, there's an interesting question, what is the critical field at which it goes? Okay? We don't know what that is. And when it goes, in a superconductor, for example, like um, a high temperature superconductor, the field at which the bulk becomes degenerate with the, with the uh, plain metal is actually very, very small. It's not hundreds of tesla. It's more like half a tesla. But beyond that, you get type two superconductivity. And the system forms vortices, an inhomogeneous system, which is still nevertheless, because it's a cooperative system, a superconductor. So this raises the question, and we're busy trying to write a paper on this, whether whatever this high field is here is, is it's analogous to an upper critical field in this system, and whether there might perhaps be a lower critical field, a field at which the system becomes degenerate with the uniform metallic state, but which perhaps a non-uniform state develops. Okay? And uh, so we're very excited at the moment about the concept of a type two condo insulator. This is one of those theorist fantasies. Uh, which has some motivation in, in new data, which I can't tell you about. Right? Um, so, um, so we're interested in the possibility that there is something resembling a flux phase, or the possibility that you might have something more conducting developing in the field. And I only say this to motivate new experiments in a magnetic field. Okay? We'd like to learn what's going on in the magnetic field. Maybe it's just inert. Okay? Maybe we have a boring vacuum like our colleagues in, in, uh, in particle yeah. physics, where you can't pick up any new excitations. But maybe this is an active vacuum. And maybe when you put a field on it, something new happens. And so that's what I'm interested in. Okay? Beyond TKIs, well, I can't resist, given Matsumoto's remarks about, uh, 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 about Weibull, to talk about what Zachary Fisk calls failed condo insulators. And one way a condo insulator can fail is, uh, is well, due to the effects of spin orbit coupling. And we've learned that the hybridization has to vanish at the high symmetry point. Okay? So if it vanishes at the high symmetry point, is it possible that it vanishes other places? 
And one idea, due to um, the case of Miyake that we heard about earlier, is that it can be hybridization vortices. Um, George Sawatsky's also been interested in this idea. It's basically because in these circumstances, if the spin, the local moment, has a very large unquenched angular momentum, then when it hybridizes in certain directions, that angular momentum cannot be taken up by the plane waves. And so as a result, the hybridization vanishes in those directions. And this is believed to occur in serum nickel tin. But we don't understand what the topological basis of these nodes is, if they exist. And uh, one idea to explain uh, a white wall is that there's a huge, great big vortex which actually has a two units of angular momentum mismatch. And when you have two units of angular momentum mismatch, you actually get a divergent density of states, which could be a driver for the strange metal phase in this system. Okay. And this is the work of uh, my former graduate student, Ramirez. Ramirez. So, is there a general cost topological classification of these strange metals with vortices? Uh, uh, we need to understand whether, whether they're stable in a crystal lattice. Okay, so I'm I don't accept to notice this extremely crazy material. This is a, a condo quasi crystal. Okay? Um, and uh, this is the work of De Gucci et al. Uh, this is a material science group. And uh, the uh, formula for this is not what I've written down here because a quasi crystal does not have a rational uh, chemical formula. This is the approximate. And they've made this one. And they've also made the real thing. And if you believe this paper, the approximate is a Fermi liquid, but the real thing is a non-Fermi liquid. Okay. Um, and this is some data that they took on the on, on the, uh, the real thing, not the approximate, showing that uh, as in the case of Wybor, the susceptibility diverges. At, uh, um, <coughs> diverges um, as a function of temperature in zero field. But as you turn on the magnetic field, it crosses over back to a regular Fermi liquid. So it's a very strange metal, apparently with some kind of divergent density of states. And if the topological idea works in the, in the uh, metal, then how could it work here? Nobody understands this material. Um, and, I, and I only show it because it suggests there's something that we really don't understand here. And when there are things you don't understand, it usually means there are many new discoveries to be made. Okay. Um, so uh, this is a strange metal like Wybor. Okay. So discussion. Those are the questions I put up. Um, and <coughs> uh, these are the questions that Jim uh, sent to me. Um, uh, and you can notice the, uh, the experimental angle here. So uh, he emphasized, as I did, about the, the need to identify new strongly correlated TI materials. Uh, mentioned how new materials, these two systems here. And what about the iridates? What are the key experiments we should be trying to do in Sumerian hexaboride? Uh, 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 can someone cross-check the rush bar splitting at the gamma bar, uh, at the gamma point, uh, or is it absent? Uh, and do I get my donut? Um, are there better samples, optics for floating zone samples? Uh, and I, we could add to that, uh, the Hasman Alton, can that be replicated by other groups? Um, uh, this point here, I don't really understand this, Jim, you have to explain this. Identify situations of materials examples of topology plays an essential role even if, if it's not uh, topologically insulated. I guess that's like these topological yeah, methods. I about things like Wybor and. Yes, yeah. okay, those very good. Systems. Okay, great. And, uh, and last but not least, as we heard at the very beginning of this meeting from Sanka Dasama, uh, what are the opportunities for using uh, Sumerian hexaboid in device configuration? Uh, uh, call it exotic physics, the devices of the future. Um, and of course, in that context, one just needs to, you know, in, in the early days, before the transistor was discovered, uh, uh, kids in the 1930s would have radios that were made from little crystals, and no one knew why these crystals amplified. They had no idea at all. They just knew empirically that they did. Okay, and then later, with materials improvement, it became possible to actually produce a semiconductor that replicated those little crystals. Okay, so in the spirit of that, I think one needs to go forward with experiment without waiting 
of improvements of sample and just try something. Uh, if you get something cool, it'd be very, very interesting. And, and so particularly in the context of device configurations, I think it's just worth a try. I, and so I second what Chan, Sandra Basama said at the beginning of the meeting. I think it's in a very important direction not to forget. Uh, it would be very easy just to focus high TC wise on the pure physics and not think about, well, maybe there's some crazy stuff that could lead to applications. So I'm going to throw this open now. I'm going to invite Jim to help me uh, in our final discussion. Uh, it's 20 past two. Taxes are coming in 25 minutes. Uh, in fact, some have already gone. Um, but we've got time for some discussion here. And, uh, thank you. Yeah, when I asked uh, Pierce to uh, give the last talk, I sort of had the sense that every every field needs needs someone to, to preach a little bit. You know, it needs somebody to get the, the enthusiasm up and uh, tell you why it's important and remind you that this stuff's worth doing. And Pierce always does that for us. And uh, I think he's the, in some sense, the, the, the intellectual leader of this field at this, at this moment. Uh, so. Uh, you did exactly what I thought you would do, and it was really very beautiful. So I thought that the general categories that I tried to outline there are, are close to what we might take as themes. You know, what, what can we do to really figure out SMB6? Um, what, what, what new materials could we think about for, for bringing this into a, a, a real subfield and not just SMB6? And then I think there's this general idea about uh, topology as, as a new aspect of solid state physics, and in particular, correlated electron physics. Uh, and so maybe we don't have to just be thinking about um, you know, topological condo insulators and topological this and, you know, new phases, but just the general concept, like, in, like it's speculated in Wybor, that that somehow a topological aspect of the electronic structure is a key element leading, leading to properties. And, and this might not be as exotic as, as new phases and, and all that, uh, but it, it seems like uh, you know, that revolutionary thing that Pierce talked about is, is the idea that, that we have a new aspect of crystal symmetry. So all of us learn at the, in the very first course that we take that uh, we have to learn about the translation group and the rotation group and k-space and Brillouin zones and that that dictates all the symmetry properties that are, that are so important. And now suddenly we have uh, people who are telling us that yes, uh, that's all true, but there's another aspect to that symmetry which is extremely important. We saw in the Iridate talk, uh, again, this exploration of the way in which uh, topology uh, lurking in the band structure that we never thought about is important. And so it seems to me this, this really could be just a general thing that we should always be alert to. And that's what I had in mind with item three there. Uh, and, and then, of course, the, the, the possibilities of doing some kind of devicey stuff and finding all that, uh, uh, all, all these exotic phases. So I, I had the sense that you guys would probably have some sort of uh, additions to what would be key experiments for SMB6 and, uh, and probably have concepts about in, any one of those, uh, those topics. Uh, if we can get you to give your good ideas away. <laughs> or, or, or pose new questions that we should add. To this. Yeah, or, or questions, <laughs> like general categories of stuff that we should add to this, uh, to, to, to these. I can type them in as it goes. Actually, I, I think that uh, some effort to follow up on the on the, the photo emission experiment uh, for the Rajpa splitting to gamma, that's that's something like that is already kind of underway. That the samples used for those experiments will will go to Jonathan Denlinger, who can then try the RPS. And it's kind of interesting to realize that we I, I think the first the, the experiments that Oliver done were the first ARPAS experiments done on the SMB6 samples that are made in in, uh, uh, in, in, in Carroll's group. So maybe the reason why you could see something in gamma had to do with the samples, and we can we can find that out. Uh, 
Um, so things of that kind that could be done uh, would, be, would be, I think, really good. Do we have other kind of key things that we might think that really ought to be done? Well, back to uh, Peter's comments with the hospital out there. How do we now say those long-term or full-term spray? Uh, just from what I can see from that data, I was making predictions that we observe how to deal with it. The major thing is how to interpret it, the angle of dependence. I think that's one big question, whether we are having a full-term service or have a two-dimensional term service. On top of that, there's uh, a new data shows some high oscillation frequency that uh, we cannot observe. Um, well, so that's a fact. Uh, all, um, I believe many groups, or some groups at least, reproduce our data. Mm -hmm. Just they are not, have not published yet. Yeah. Jim just told me that he's not willing to publish his, the Hasma author. In fact, data, just because the mass is light, yeah. it's all the same light mass. And he, well, his student is curious to see why. So that's why I hold on that. They see the oscillation frequency, oscillation rules above 30 Kelvin. That's just like what we observe, yeah. which means a light mass. So this reflects whether, I think you raise an interesting point, right? Um, so we can rule out it's aluminum, but we cannot rule out the action process when we try to get aluminum away from the surface. Would that create a special work function change or whatever? To change the thermal surface, uh, to change the surface condition. Mm -hmm. So, talk, listen to Philip's talk. Um, I, I, I think they're offering a very uh, interesting um, approach. So, you have something happening maybe on the top of the surface, and then you can try to get rid of it by, uh, by radiation, by ion, right? So, we're talking about getting their samples to see if there will be any topological protect surface space beneath mm -hmm. this homomorphism. Uh, in, uh, if that's the case, then any signal signal will be very interesting. Then, if there's any difference in vacuum max, that'll be that 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 answers a lot of questions. Qubit turn out to be failed conduit slaters. Maybe the cerium uh, ruthenium force tin six is an exception, but um, uh, and so um, 
So then within that smaller class, which is probably about 10 condo insulators, you've now got to have the conditions, the, the D bands, cross at an odd number of points. And part of the problem is, and we encountered that in our early theory, is that if you start to push them towards the, to the condo limit, they often actually become weak topological insulators. You can't fill the band too much. Uh, it just happens that when you cross three times, yeah. you're still in the region where you don't fill the band too much, or you, and, and, and you can actually get to the condo region before it switches over and crosses at the fourth point. So we don't really understand these things. We don't really understand the interplay of the long-range coolant interaction with heavy fermion physics that drives the formation of an insulator. So a lot of uncertainties there. Yes? I think molecular gas has not been predicted for some of Within the list of, of materials uh, that are sort of like uh, SMB6 in the sense that the conduction electrons all come from the valence mixing process, uh, there is one other empiric connection that might, or kind of empiric fact that might be connected to Pierce's interest in the role of magnetism. So it's, it, it seems to be true that the ones that actually make a gap are the ones where the two valence states involved uh, have one uh, being non-magnetic. Uh, so for example, the, you know, the samariums would be an obvious case. So you got uh, 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 4F6 is J equals zero and 4F5 is magnetic. Uh, in the cerium systems, you have F0, which is non-magnetic in a trivial way, and F1, which is magnetic. If you now look at thulium selenide, uh, that's a system which is a mix of F12 and F13, and both of the systems actually turn out to have magnetic ground states. And, and thulium selenide uh, is a metal and, and doesn't open a gap until you actually let it order magnetically, and then you get a gap which is uh, due to the magnetic ordering. One of the things that I've done uh, is try to encourage uh, my, my, my colleague Kai to think about whether that gap that opens up in the antiferromagnetic state of thulium selenide could have a topological character to it. But anyway, uh, somehow the, the need for a gap seems to be connected to uh, having one, one of the two valence states be non-magnetic. Just empirically, that seems to be so. And, and, and that something somehow, somehow worked its way back to this thing we were talking about earlier, you know, what, what quenches the magnetism, and, and why is that a key element of, uh, of getting, actually getting the insulating character as well? We did think about um, the family of starting with iron, iron suicide. Iron suicide is kind of a kind of insulator, um, but of course there's not much good or weak coupling there. Uh, it has the awkwardness that it doesn't have a, a center of symmetry, so yeah. you can't just do a simple analysis. But we did look at uh, iron, ruthenium, and osmium silicide, and uh, theoretically, and unfortunately, none of them are topological. But nevertheless, it raises the interesting possibility that if you could get something like iron silicide, which had strong spin orbit coupling, uh, uh, a cubic type compound, you might be able to find a, a large gap topological insulator. Um, so, but that would presumably require that you either do make the iron more a stronger spin orbit coupling, which is the reason why we thought about osmium, or maybe you'd have to replace the silicon by something that has strong spin orbit coupling. What happens to uh, antimony? Uh, iron antimony, I don't think it's an insulator, but uh, I don't know the answer to that question. Yeah. Can I come in with back to this one? Because as, as we know, for the first time, someone in Shabrat was investigated some more than 50 years ago. And then his general understanding was that there is an EGF state, and this is some three to four EVs from the bottom of this conduction band. But all this, uh, I would say, uh, up to date, modern spectroscopy. 
spectroscopic method like ARPES, uh, potential spectroscopy, they somehow do not see these spin gap states. Even in the case when these uh, samples are not clean, first there are some, some donor states coming from imperfections, from, from, from impurities. I, I do not somehow understand because I, I think many of these microscopic phenomena which are investigated, transport, specific heat, and so on and so on, have somehow seen this indirectly, these in gap states, but these new methods do not see it at all. I, I don't know if these states are related with these balance fluctuations. Is this something typical observed by these, these spectroscopic methods? Or this, this is not for me not clear because for, for many microscopic investigations, one would expect that these in gap states are there. But from these new methods, nobody sees. Yeah, and you're thinking of bulk in gap states. Just, just to be clear, I mean, we could argue that we've seen surface in gap states real easy, uh, real very easily, but you have in mind some the bulk in gap states. I mean, we could wonder if there shouldn't be an electronics, you know, some photoemission signature of the of what we heard Colin tell us about. I mean, yeah, it's, a, it's some kind of an exciton, but you should be able to pull an electron out. You could imagine that you could pull an electron out of the system and perhaps leave the system in a, in a, in a, in a state that remembers that, that particular uh, po possible excited state of the system. You know, if, this, if that comes down to couplings and that sort of thing. But it would be nice if we could uh, you know, see, I, I agree, see these states. Well, actually, um, uh, Peter Armitage did report optics, which he interpreted as being possibly uh, you know, a donor band so I would say Peter came close to saying that he saw something that might be like, uh, yeah, that might be one version of the possible in-gap states. It wouldn't certainly be the, the exciton that, that uh, has been seen in neutron scattering. And then also possible there's just more than one kind of state too. I mean, we could have donor states uh, playing a certain role and we could, have a magnetic exciton. I mean, you don't know very much about what's in this gap, or at least we don't know much in detail about what's in it. I thought it was a pretty cool idea, actually, that Colin was willing to consider that his state might be the, the origin of the electrons that we're going to liberate and, and see in the transport at high temperatures. I mean, that... Uh, that would be pretty neat. I mean, certainly we, we know about excitons and semiconductors, but we would never imagine them as the source of, you know, as a source of electrons that we're then going to see when we, when we uh, raise the temperature. So, so I, mean, I, would, I would have put myself in that category until very recently. Um, but there, ha there are long-standing questions about, for example, the, the large N approach to the condo lattice. Um, uh, the the, the um, Colton Senti in uh, mean field theories talk about something called ellipsis theory and the fact that you could never break a, a local gauge symmetry. This is true in the condolasses. It's also true in a superconductor, curiously, as well. And what's interesting is that the phase of the slate boson in the metallic state uh, grows logarithmically with time, giving rise to power law correlations in time that are really connected with the so-called X-ray catastrophe. And that tells us that the metal, there cannot be anything but a crossover. But the curious thing about the insulator is that because of the gap, the phase fluctuations of this would be all the parameters are actually finite. They don't grow with time. There's always been a mystery. If they don't grow with time, then is it still a crossover? What's going on there? And these are some questions that have never been satisfactorily answered. Um, uh, so 
if it were a type, if it had a type two phase, and this is now the science fiction notion, then that type two phase would break translational symmetry, possibly. Okay. And that would then pinch the phase transition at zero field, make the crossover at zero field, making it essentially into a sort of hidden phase transition. So here's just our attempt to try and put some order and some ideas into the field that we don't know if the right idea. Even if it appears in that situation, you still need some symmetry, right? Broken. Well, the, the example point, that we talked about the other day, right. where this was, you made an analogy to a super vector, yes. you still break U1. You, well, actually, a purist will tell you that you don't. But the, the Elitzer's theorem apply only if you have a superfluid, you're right. But for a superconductor, you're wrong. You don't break U1 symmetry because you can, you can always gauge away that supposed broken symmetry. Um, and uh, uh, the, the point is the phase doesn't exist in a superconductor from the point of view of gauge invariance because you absorb it into the electro electromagnetic field. And so you can only, you cannot, unless you fix a gauge, you cannot define a broken symmetry. There's endless discussions about this in, uh, between particle physicists and condensed matter physicists. Superconductivity, technically speaking, does not break the U1 symmetry. Um, and uh, uh, we just ignore that fact when we do Landau theory. We, we pick a gauge, we pick the London gauge. Okay? And then in that context, it's true. But there is a very nice paper, which I only partially understand, by Vadim uh, Organison and Shivaji Sondi, which says that actually superconductors are in fact topological uh, phases of matter. And the only order parameter there is a non-local object. So, all that to say that, that uh, we don't really understand all these issues. When there's a gauge symmetry, it becomes much more ambiguous about whether there are phase transitions. So how does, it, how does the superconductor have a finite temperature phase transition? That's all part of the mystery. Right. Maybe it's the same reason. Yeah. So it, is, <laughs> it is kind of maybe this one could resolve. I mean, I, I, yeah. yeah uh, uh, <coughs> a year ago, um, uh, we went to visit Phil Anderson in the hospital, and he, he had a problem with his heart. And his, uh, his daughter said, please go and talk to him. Uh, physics will get him going, but don't <laughs> touch him. Don't talk about high TC. We went to talk to him, and um, we, we had a fascinating half, half hour. He broke up when he came in, started talking animatedly. And one of the things he talked about was exactly this issue issue of a superconductor and whether it had an order parameter. And he talked about it in the connection also with the issue of supersonics, which he is one of the few people who still believes in the concept of a supersolid and other things there. He was so animated about it that when the doctor came in and said, we've got to do a scan, he said, excuse me, I've got to finish my paragraph. And it was basically on this issue. So, so I think these are open, some of these things are still open questions, actually. During the tutorial session, I showed and, and fairly early uh, plot that, that, that came from a, a, an, a, an EPR experiment in which they had doped some gadolinium, I think, into SMV6 and looked at the EPR signal. And then from the broadening of the EPR signal, which was interpreted as being due to electrons uh, that were being generated across the gap, uh, they looked at a temperature dependence, and so they fit the temperature dependence to an Arrhenius plot, and then they found that they had to let the gap be temperature dependent in order to uh, fit the data. In it. And so then they plotted what the temperature dependence of the gap was. I think it's one of the early plots of the gap variation as a function of temperature, and I think Pierce uh, commented that it's astounding the extent to which that plot looked almost like a BCS a BCS plot of delta versus T going to zero somewhere around 150 kelvins, which is about where spectroscopies would would nowadays be saying that it happened. But it, it really, you know, it's a pretty simple, nice experiment. I think it's a very good mystery on which to close the, the meeting. <laughs> End on the mystery, I think. Does anyone have any more questions? Yes? Really, I'm not clear whether the gas side 
I mean, the Fourier temperature should be very in the in terms of the depth also. And uh, it, we have even the dissipated system where this charge is really easily reduced to uh, for, from our surface data or uh, hard X-ray data. There is a, a surface which is going four to three plus, and there is a also a subcross region. And it, since there is a sub surface layer, so I think maybe the Fourier temperature even can be varied uh, in terms of the depth. Yeah, so that makes sense. Uh, uh, maybe our temperature dependent schedule should consider this variation in gas. Yeah. So different X-ray images to probe how. So I think it's it's fine to uh, to to end at this point. I just want you to hang around a minute. Uh, Charlie and I just ran off down the hall to get our secretary, Beth Demkowski, who most of you have had some interaction with, and we have some flowers we want to give her, and you might uh, join us in thanking her for, for this uh, good effort that she has put in on our behalf. So I think she'll be back in just a moment. Um, yeah, and we're getting some pictures. Ah, so here at the back of the room is, is, is the famous Beth, whom you, many of you may know only from emails. Um, if we can uh, get you to come up. So we want to thank you for all you've done for us. Uh, everybody here owes you some, some debt of gratitude for all your efforts, and certainly the organizers uh, couldn't uh, have done anything without you interacting with the papers and writing the emails and I don't know all the things you did. Oh, you and so these are for you. Oh, thank you very much. Okay. So everybody's taking pictures and uh, flashing this and that, but I think basically we're done. I want to also say that uh, Talia Kurdak, uh, you didn't, he didn't get a lot of face time in this meeting, but uh, but he certainly has uh, made sure that kind of a lot of the global organization happened right, and he made sure that the budget got got <coughs> we met the budget and we didn't overspend. And you never know. <laughs>